Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for our webinar titled Understanding the Issues Affecting the Accuracy of Measuring Oxygen Consumption Utilizing Metabolic Carts. This is Haley McCaffrey from Inside Scientific and I will be your host for today's event. Our session is sponsored by AEI Technologies and will feature a presentation on key issues affecting the accuracy and reproducibility of measuring oxygen consumption via indirect calorimetry using metabolic carts and best practices for scientists to drive more consistent and precise measurements. During this webinar, Phil Loeb, president of AEI Technologies, will introduce the measurements, variables, and factors in determining VO2. Next, he will examine common sources of error and challenges that influence accuracy and reproducibility, and review validation methods commonly used by the research community. Finally, Danny Rutar, Managing Director of Redback Biotech, will present best practices as embodied by the MOXIS metabolic cart that are proven to minimize data error. Thank you for joining us today. We are going to discuss the measurements and other factors in VO2 determination. Note that we will use VO2 and oxygen consumption interchangeably in this presentation. We're also discussing errors and other issues in determining VO2 and how to minimize those errors. Then summarize metabolic card validation methods. And finally, explain how the MOXIS metabolic card minimizes errors. The most common methods to determine VO2 by indirect calorimetry are the Douglas bag method, which accumulates a number of breaths in a bag to be analyzed later, using metabolic cart with a canopy hood for resting energy studies, room calorimetry, and for this presentation, measuring every breath using a metabolic cart. What is a metabolic cart? A metabolic cart measures pulmonary ventilation of every breath, oxygen concentration, both inspiratory and expiratory, carbon dioxide concentration, again, both inspiratory and expiratory, also ambient temperature, pressure, and humidity. Temperature, pressure, and humidity are used to convert the metabolic data from atmospheric conditions to standard temperature, pressure, and dry conditions, or STPD. Finally, this measurement data is used to calculate oxygen consumption and CO2 production and other metabolic data. To calculate oxygen consumption, subtract the amount of expired oxygen from the amount of inspired oxygen. To calculate CO2 production, subtract the amount of inspired oxygen from the amount of expired carbon dioxide. I'm sorry. In both cases, this O2 and CO2 concentrations are assumed to be dry gases. Also, expiratory ventilation may be determined from inspiratory ventilation, or vice versa, by application of the Haldane transform, where expiratory ventilation equals inspiratory ventilation times the ratio of nitrogen, inspiratory nitrogen to expiratory nitrogen. O2 consumption and CO2 production are determined by either a direct application of these equations, which is the preferred approach, or a combination of these equations and proprietary algorithms. It is important to note that VO2 and VCO2 are derived values, not measured values. There are two types of metabolic carts, the breath-by-breath -breath system and the mixing chamber system. In the breath by breast system, as shown here, the gas sample is drawn directly from the subject's mouth to be analyzed by the gas analyzers. At the same time, the subject is expiring to the flow device to measure flow. The mixing chamber systems typically add two additional components, a non-rebreathing valve and a mixing chamber. The non-rebreathing valve allows only expiratory air into the mixing chamber. The mixing chamber mixes the expiratory air for a more homogeneous sample. 
The gas sample is then drawn directly from the mixing chamber to be analyzed by the gas analyzers. Both system types have their respective advantages and disadvantages. However, AEI and many researchers believe that mixing chamber systems advantages far outweigh the disadvantages and are more accurate in determining VO2 and VCO2. Metabolic carts make quite a few physical measurements. These are oxygen concentration for both inspiratory and expiratory air, carbon dioxide concentration for both inspiratory and expiratory air, flow, where flow and time are used to drive breath volume, and flow is also used to determine the start and end of a breath. Temperature, pressure, and humidity that are used for STPD correction. Note, some metabolic carts require the operator to provide temperature, pressure, and humidity devices. And time measurements, which are used to derive breath volume in conjunction with flow and are used to synchronize a breath with the flow. Also, metabolic carts have many other factors that affect accuracy, including calibration of the system physical measurement devices, the calibration gas, the testing environment, subject preparation, metabolic cart setup and maintenance, time delays of gas sampling, operator initiated errors, and humidity of the gas sample. A word on calibration. Calibration is a comparison to a standard and usually results in an adjustment. Calibration does not mean zero errors. Calibration does not improve the manufacturer's specified accuracy, but at best brings the accuracy of equipment up to factory specifications. Note that the device specs assume the device was correctly calibrated. Generally, you want to calibrate at two or more points or as specified by the manufacturer. These calibration points should be close to the minimum and maximum of the expected data points. You want to use a calibration standard as accurate as possible or specified by the manufacturer. After calibration, new zero or offset operating points are set, and sometimes span or gain operating points are set. Each of these physical measurements and other factors has an error associated with it. As you can see, there are quite a few potential errors. We will go through the most important ones individually in more detail. The oxygen analyzer accuracy is the greatest source of error in metabolic cart systems. I'll have an example of the need for an accurate oxygen analyzer a little later on. Also, all gas analyzers are affected by interfering gases. These are unknown or unexpected gases in the ambient air which will produce an unwanted response from the oxygen analyzer. Having a room with fresh outside air will minimize this problem. The carbon dioxide analyzer accuracy is a significant source of VCO2 error. I will have an example of the need for an accurate CO2 analyzer a little later on also. Like the oxygen analyzer, the carbon dioxide analyzer is also subject to interfering gas errors. Calibration gas cylinder accuracy is an important issue. It is best to use a primary laboratory standard accurate to 0.02% absolute. I'll have an example of this a little later on also. All gas analyzers are sensitive to change in the pressure of the gas. This must be either controlled or minimized by calibrating under the same conditions as sampling. Also, insufficient gas analyzer stabilization times during calibration produce erroneous readings. Need to wait for the gas analyzers to stabilize completely. In many cases, the metabolic cart handles this automatically for you. Metabolic carts typically use either a tube turbine or pneumatech to measure flow. 
A turbine device counts rev revolutions of an impeller, where one revolution represents the fixed volume. A pneumatic is a differential pressure device, where flow is proportional to the pressure drop across a mesh or screen. Both devices have similar types of error. Turbine flow measurement errors include the moment of inertia compensation needed to correct for the starting and stopping of the impeller during a breath, and impeller contamination from the subject and ambient particulates. This error can be minimized by measuring flow on the inspiratory side and regular cleaning. Pneumatic flow measurement errors include the linearization compensation needed to correct for the pneumatic's nonlinear flow signal. This is minimized by using a device that provides very accurate compensation over a wide range. Like the turbine, contamination on the wire mesh of the pneumatic is an issue that can be minimized by measuring flow on the inspiratory side and regular cleaning. The equations for VO2 and VCO2 assume dry gas is measured. Therefore, the gas sample must be either dried before analyzing or measured and compensated for. For example, at 25 degrees C, oxygen concentration changes 0.007% per degree percent uh, RH change. Therefore, a 10% change in relative humidity results in a significant 0.07% change in O2 concentration. The effect of CO2 is much smaller. At 25 degrees C, CO2 changes 0.002% per percent RH change. And the 10% change in CO2 results in a smaller 0.02% change in CO2 concentration. The FN tubing is the most commonly used to remove at least some of the water vapor in the gas sample. The FN tubing is highly selective for the removal of water vapor. We and others have found that the FN tubing is not ideal, and its ability to remove water vapor may change over the testing period. The FN tubing needs regular replacement according to the metabolic carb manufacturer's instructions. Desiccant may also be used to remove water vapor. Desiccant is not ideal and humidity may change over the testing period. Desiccant needs regular replacement according to the manufacturer's instructions. Also, leaks in the gas sampling path may introduce unwanted humidity effects. Leaks need to be checked for and repaired before testing. To calculate cumulative error, First, the VO2 error contribution of each of the error sources should be calculated from the manufacturer's specifications over the likely testing range. I'll show a couple of examples in just a moment. Then, the total VO2 error can be computed by using the square root of the sum of the squares method for every contributor to VO2 error. I will now be presenting examples of two common metabolic card sources of VO2 and VCO2 errors, gas calibration error and calibration gas error. This example uh, utilizes the textbook equations for exercise and also assumes that all other errors are zero. So his first example is a gas analyzer with an O2 accuracy of 0.1% absolute and a CO2 accuracy of 0.1% absolute. As you can see, I've uh, introduced some standard uh, values for uh, inspiratory and expiratory uh, oxygen concentration, CO2, that you might expect uh, in exercise. And then calculated the worst case values for this uh, gas analyzer. And then went on to, to look at the error contribution uh, to VO2, VCO2, and RER errors 
do this gas analyzer. And you can see the, the errors could be uh, quite significant. The next example is a gas analyzer with an O2 accuracy of 0.01% absolute and a CO2 accuracy of 0.02% absolute. And again, I used the same expected values and calculated the worst case values for this particular gas analyzer and went on to show that the air contribution from this gas analyzer for VO2, VCO2, and RER is significantly less. In conclusion, the above examples are typical of an exercise test. Resting energy testing would produce much greater error in both examples because of smaller O2 and CO2 concentrations. Metabolic carts using less accurate gas analyzers may have errors far outside of acceptable limits. The next examples are examples of calibration gas error. And again, we're going to be using the standard textbook equations and assume that all other errors are zero. This first example uses calibration gas with an uncertainty of 5% relative. We've actually spoken to customers who have purchased this inaccurate gas for calibration. And we're picking some temporary, uh, some typical uh, expected values and then looking at the worst case values for this particular calibration gas. And then when we look at the air contribution for this calibration gas, we can see that it's uh, extremely high for v VO2 and RER, and even VCO2 is quite high. So uh, now we're going to go on to look at the next example, which utilizes a calibration gas with an uncertainty of 0.02% absolute, as recommended by AEI. And again, using the same expected values for O2, CO2, and flow, we calculated the worst case values for this particular calibration gas. And the air contribution, as you can see on the right here, for VO2, VCO2, and RER is significantly reduced and much more reasonable. In conclusion, the above examples are typical of an exercise test. And again, resting energy testing would produce much greater error in both examples because of smaller O2 and CO2 metric concentrations. Metabolic carts using less accurate calibration gas may have errors far outside of acceptable limits. What is validation? Validation is proving the metabolic cart does what it's designed to do. To discuss validation, I need to reiterate that a metabolic cart measures pulmonary ventilation of every breath, oxygen concentration, carbon dioxide concentration, temperature, pressure, and humidity, and uses those to calculate O2 consumption and CO2 production. Metabolic cart validation should include both verification of physical measurement components and system verification, determ um, determination of VO2, VCO2. It's important that all metabolic cart system components are working properly to the manufacturer's specifications before a system validation is attempted. And although each component can be verified independently, however, this does not guarantee that the system is validated. It's best to periodically return components to manufacturer for factory testing. If this is not practical, an on-site verification may be performed using standards at multiple points in the operating range. However, component verification by the operator may not be feasible nor meaningful if the equations used to derive VO2 and VCO2 are not known. For system verification, uh, an alcohol burn produces 
O2, CO2, and water vapor is byproducts of combustion. The concentration of each can be calculated by applying the appropriate stoichiometric equations. VO2 and VCO2 values are typical of resting levels, thus an alcohol burn is not practical for exercise. We have studied alcohol burns and found they provide typically good accuracy and repeatability for verifying RER. However, v VO2 and VCO2 have limited accuracy and repeatability. This method is very low cost and easy to perform. Subject variability testing is not a true verification, but is a good measure of expected subject ver testing variability. Test subjects should be tested multiple times at different levels of exercise. The Douglas bag method is the traditional method for assessing O2 consumption. However, it was not designed as a validation test method for metabolic hearts, but it can be used for comparing test results. The Douglas bag method is subject to all the same measurement and other errors as with the metabolic hearts. System calibrators can accurately simulate a breath and input these breaths to the metabolic heart. The amounts of oxygen, carbon dioxide, flow, and humidity are delivered in precise known amounts. Therefore, the oxygen consumption and carbon dioxide production input to the metabolic heart can be precisely determined. Note that accurate temperature, pressure, and humidity measurements are also required. And the calibrator should provide 100% relative humidity output to better simulate expiratory air. This is the closest you can get to a true system validation verification method and is also the most accurate. Some system calibrators are commercially available, some are proprietary. They're also very expensive and may not be practical for many labs. And uh, welcome everybody to uh, my part of the presentation. Uh, Phil's been talking to you about uh, various components in metabolic systems, about their uh, contribution to accuracy and uh, it's explained various different sensors, calibration gases, and, uh, and the different types of systems and, and how they work using block diagrams. Uh, what I'm going to do now is try and explain to you some of the solutions uh, that the AEI MOXA system provides. Uh, this talk is sponsored by AEI and uh, we're just going to go through the MOXA system and it's, uh, the way it solves these problems. So the MOXA system is uh, a modular system and by that uh, it, I mean you can actually utilize some of the components individually uh, as well as using it as a whole metabolic cars. So uh, this is done uh, by some researchers who are looking at uh, CO2, for example, uh, looking at brain studies and some people who are looking at, for example, uh, measuring uh, oxygen as a result of photosynthesis of leaves. Uh, also you can see uh, because it's not a closed system you can access a lot of the uh, componentry and you can uh, easily uh, fault find if, if that's necessary. The other uh, nice thing about this particular uh, system is that it uses textbook equations so it's very easy to validate the system. Uh, this isn't uh, altogether possible uh, by other systems uh, like breath by breath systems uh, and very few of these systems actually show the algorithms. Breath by breath systems use uh, proprietary algorithms to smooth the, uh, the very noisy data that comes from those sorts of systems and, uh, and for that reason it makes it very difficult to, to have traceability back to basic SI units. Uh, just to show you uh, and to reiterate the block diagram uh, that Phil had shown you, uh, we can see here this is the inspired uh, volume measurement and uh, we, uh, the MOXA system uses a new attack. So if we just have a look here on the right hand side we can see this circular item here is the pneumatac. Uh, it then transfers the uh, expired gases to uh, the one-way valve, which you can see over here on the diagram. So this tubing just uh, uh, takes the information or the, uh, the gases 
uh, and then goes to the mixing chamber. This down here uh, is the mixing chamber where the, the tube is going into. I think you can see that pretty well. From there, uh, the uh, expir expiratory gases either are exhaust, uh, exhausted or a small sample is taken to the CO2 analyzer and the O2 analyzer. Uh, and you can see here the pump. So the O2 analyzer uh, is this large box and the CO2 is underneath it here. Okay. Now I just want to uh, draw your attention and ask you to fo focus very closely on this particular table. This is a really important piece of information. So this table is extracted from a paper produced by Dr. Chris Gore and his colleagues at the Australian Institute of Sport. Uh, it's nothing overly unique other than that he has actually done this, uh, categorically explained how VO2 error is translated from uh, various other parameters including O2. So here we have the expired oxygen fractions and if we have changed the, each of these parameters, ox, uh, expired oxygen, uh, inspired ventilation, the room barometric pressure and CO2, uh, by a relative error of 1%, you'll see what happens on the right hand side here for the VO2 error. So we can see here, and this is in order of priority, we can see that the top two factors here are oxygen concentration and ventilation. Now, we can see that this relative error of 1% actually translates to a 0.17% absolute error. Now, this comes from the fact that down here are our reference values. So, in fact, the uh, inspired, expired O2 is 17.51%. Okay, and so that's what the 1% relative error is. So as we can see, a very small change uh, results in uh, a 6.5% error in VO2, which is really significant. Now here are the typical values that come about from these particular components. Now we can see that typically it's only about a half a percent change, but this will translate to more than 3% error in VO2. And that's only one contributing factor to the whole VO2 error, which as Phil had explained earlier, comes from a lot of other different uh, components, including ventilation and CO2. Now, interestingly, ventilation is actually the second most important, and for good reason, because typically the values for the error values for ventilation are more like 2% error. Okay, so this will translate to a 2% VO2 error. So these errors are starting to accumulate quite a bit. Now, in the case of the MOXA system, this is down to 1% most of the time. Now, as you can see here, the barometric pressure uh, is a one-to-one -one relationship, a 1% error to a 1% VO2 error. However, the typical value for this particular error is very low and does not translate as anything really significant. Uh, similarly, CO2 uh, has a, a, a relationship to the VO2, but again, nowhere near the VO2 error. So the take home message here is this, if you have an, uh, a metabolic car, you must look at the O2 sensor. The error or the, the specifications for this are really paramount when it comes to the, the VO2 error. Okay, so let's get on to uh, just describing the MOXIS system in terms of its accuracy. Uh, it uses a zirconia oxide uh, cell. It's not typical in, in many uh, metabolic systems, but this is the basis for the, really the success of the, the MOXA system. The zirconia oxide runs at about 700 degrees inside a cell. Uh, however, you can see here the accuracy is really high and the VO2 contribution is very low in comparison to, to most other systems. The other thing about zirconia is that it uh, not only does it have the lowest error, but it's extremely stable over a long period of time and I'll get into that a bit later. So here is a, a quick comparison of the three typical uh, metabolic cart oxygen sensors. Here is the zirconia, in the middle here is the paramagnetic system, and to the right here is the galvanic fuel cell. Okay, so very briefly how these work. The O2 uh, zirconia in the, in, uh, cell uses the O2 in an equation exchanging uh, itself an electron and uh, it cannot actually react to any other uh, components other than oxygen and that is the reason it is 
can be tuned to a very, very high precision and a, uh, subsequently a very high accuracy. Now, the paramagnetic system, which is quite common as well, uh, simply means that if you push uh, a sample of any of these gases towards uh, a magnetic field, they will produce uh, an, an output current uh, using the, the magnetic sensors. Not quite this way, but this is a, a very good way of thinking about it. Um, now, uh, the only issue about that is uh, things like CO2 and nitrogen also have some very small paramagnetic properties and they interfere with the ability of this particular cell to be very sensitive. Um, now the uh, galvanic fuel cell works a little bit like a car battery actually uh, where you have an anode and a cathode and you have a gel uh, substance in between and uh, a semi-permeable Teflon membrane which uh, is semi-permeable to oxygen and so when oxygen travels into this cell it conducts and produces an output. Now just quickly to, to go through the different parameters here, um, the zirconia cell is a very long life cell and you can see on average about 20 years and there are many uh, that are out there that are about over 30 years, uh, of, uh, 30 years old. Uh, the paramagnetic uh, O2 cell uh, doesn't quite go as long but you can see it goes quite long and uh, the galvanic fuel cell although um, can go for something like uh, two years. The real cell, reliable cell life is more like about 12 months and most experienced users will, will change it in that period of time. Now, uh, just quickly explain, the sensitivity of uh, the zirconia cell is 0.001%. Uh, now that is the most accurate by a very long way. And again, it, it has been used in uh, the photosynthesis experiments since about the 1970s, uh, since Gaul et al. Uh, and every decade since uh, they have been using this particular technology to measure O2 coming off leaves. So that, that means it really is very sensitive. Again, the most accurate. And if you have a look at this uh, drift figure, it's really, really low over a, a period of 24 hours. In comparison, um, the paramagnetic cells are about 0.1 to 0.05% in terms of their accuracy and sensitivity. And you can see the drift uh, is nowhere near as good, uh, almost, I suppose, five to ten times the amount uh, of, of the zirconia in practice. Um, very quickly, uh, the galvanic fuel cell, you can see their parameters here. It suffers, though, from a very high drift component. So we did say that flow is really important, or uh, volume, whichever way you, you want to look at this particular parameter. Now the uh, metabolic uh, car produced by AI, the MOXA system, has a very low uh, flow error of around 1% uh, on average, um, and its contribution to VO2 error is quite low as well. Um, the next important factor in the MOXA system is this large mixing chamber. Now, uh, I won't go into the details here, but uh, just so you know that every breath is recorded uh, and uh, the O2 and CO2 are very easily synchronized uh, using the simple physics of uh, the flow of gas through the large tubes and, uh, and can be timed and, and resynced to the O2 and CO2 sensors. Again, uh, they're completely traceable um, equations uh, and they are provided by the MOXA system uh, in, the, in, in their manuals. This whole system, of course, has been validated many times using Douglas bags and simulators. And uh, one of the uh, unique features you'll see in here that there's actually a, a fan inside this uh, mixing chamber and it helps to improve the mixing uh, and also the response time. Phil mentioned that uh, calibration gas is important. Now, of course, the system uh, is only really as good as your ability to trace back to uh, scientific standards. And uh, if you, in fact, have uh, a calibration gas that has more than about 0.02% absolute error, uh, you really are starting to fall outside of uh, acceptable limits when you're looking at uh, athletes or research uh, and, and for other use of course as well. The CO2 uh, system that comes with the MOXIS is uh, 
it's top of its class. It's uh, the only system that uses a, a reference uh, cell. Now what that means is it has uh, a sample of actual CO2 at a known value and it uses a chopper motor to uh, change between the reference cell and the actual incoming sample. And so for that reason uh, you have a very uh, self-calibrating system which is happening many times per second. Uh, the response time also for this system is really fast uh, and that's important as well. Of course with the rest of the system uh, you would expect the same high uh, tolerances for all these other parameters which are being used to correct for the uh, flow and uh, the, the gas sample uh, in terms of STPD as uh, Phil had explained earlier. So this is the, uh, the t uh, pneumatac that's being used to measure flow and this box here are the compensating electronics and they have all the sensors, the temperature, relative humidity and pressure built in. Okay, so one of the most important aspects of uh, the MOXA system is that it's able to uh, remove aberrant breaths or any other issues uh, where, you, where you see that there's data that has issues with it. So the aberrant breaths would include things like size and swallowing, coughing, or some of the real life value uh, issues that happen uh, when, when you're measuring uh, things with people. Of course this is impossible with Douglas bags because uh, all of the sample is taken into the bag and actually it's very difficult with breath by breath systems. So uh, in, in short it allows you to eliminate uh, rows of data that you uh, don't want to include into the data set because you can see that these have issues. Now uh, of course it's very uh, important to have a look at in fact, at the whole system. And uh, Phil had explained earlier that if we take the tolerances of the manufacturer specifications for O2, CO2, ventilation, and of course all the other factors, uh, the correct method of looking at the error for these systems is using the square root of all of these individual errors squared. Okay? Uh, and so what happens, uh, or rather their contribution to the VO2 error squared, and so what happens with the MOXA system, as you can see here, using the zirconia cell, we end up with a VO2 error of about 1%. Using other systems and, and inserting their uh, errors for the different sensor components, you'll see that the uh, errors can be quite high. Okay. So the take-home mission here is have a look at the O2 specification for your uh, metabolic cart. Um, don't be led into believing that uh, a 0.1% error for O2 is, is good. In fact, it's nowhere near good enough for most applications. And something close to 0.01% is really what you need. Okay, so we're coming to the end of our uh, presentation. And in summary, uh, I just want to reiterate some of the things that we've been talking to you about. So Phil had covered some of these uh, points here. Uh, he's spoken about what the typical measurements are and, and how they affect VO2. Um, I'm sure you've realised uh, through this talk that there are a lot of things that can go wrong uh, with a metabolic cast um, and most of the time unbeknownst to the, to the user. So it's very important that you keep on top of these uh, issues. Um, we've provided some of the ideas and examples of how these uh, can be minimised. One of the unfortunate uh, aspects of this uh, science is that there's no universally accepted standard for the validation of metabolic carts. And that doesn't make it very helpful to people who are using metabolic carts or people who are looking to buy metabolic carts because uh, metabolic carts that aren't quite as good uh, are very hard to distinguish from ones that are. Finally, we've also uh, just gone through uh, my section which is just explaining how the Moxus metabolic cart provides uh, solutions to these problems uh, in, a very, uh, high by, in a very high standard. So uh, in conclusion, uh, we just wanted to uh, acknowledge some of the references for this uh, presentation and uh, of course you'll be able to uh, obtain the, this information after our talk. A um, couple of questions that have come in already. Um, does a general consensus exist regarding limits of precision of VO2 measurements? If yes, what is it? 
there's no standard requirement for VO2 accuracy. Uh, however, I uh, might consider a point of reference uh, that the best metabolic simulators have an accuracy of about 2%. Uh, therefore, uh, the best accuracy you, you can validate uh, O2 uh, is under ideal circumstances is to 2%. And more practically, VO2 can be validated uh, with these simulators to an accuracy of about 4%, probably at best. Okay, great. Danny, did you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, I would um, I'd simply uh, say that when we're looking at uh, athletes, uh, I think we need to talk in very high precisions. If we're talking about the general population, uh, we have a little bit more tolerance. If we are looking at, say, a 12-week regime of some strength and conditioning or aerobic training or something like that from a general population, uh, we can be much more forgiving uh, with our tolerances. Uh, however, if we're looking at athletes or if we're looking at research that uh, needs that level of precision, then uh, the short answer is that it'll have to be much more precise uh, down to the very small percentages. Okay, great. Um, is there a calibration that has to be done between participants? This is in the case that you're studying using multiple um, individuals or participants. Well, uh, when you do multiple tests in, in a row, um, for publication, and, and the best results, uh, we recommend calibrating flow uh, O2 and CO2 before every test. Uh, for the MOXA system, uh, you can still achieve the best results by performing these calibrations about once every hour. Um, okay. And that's, I think, about the, uh, you know, what we, we could recommend. I think most of the other manufacturers, uh, metabolic carts, uh, would be similar. Okay, great. Um, and then while we're on the topic of calibration, how is the flow calibration performed? Well, most metabolic carts utilize a calibration syringe and that delivers a very precisely known volume for calibrating flow. A calibration syringe is typically uh, a volume of uh, three liters and uh, which would be used for calibrating flow for exercise testing. And they have other size syringes available uh, for different applications. Okay. Um, and this question came up in various ways throughout the registration. Um, and it comes from mouthpiece versus mask. Um, Phil, what are your recommendations or what is your opinion? Um, is there a large enough discrepancy in results to value one? over the other? Well, there, there is, um, I guess, historically, uh, we've recommended uh, using a mouthpiece and a, and a, mat and a nose clip uh, over a mask to minimize uh, the leaking uh, because simply the, the masks weren't very good and they tend to produce uh, leaks around the mask. Uh, for a lot of subjects. Uh, however, there's some new new masks that are available that, that are much better. And uh, so I, I'm pretty much uh, equal on uh, whether or not we want to use a, a mask or mouthpiece and have to look at the, each individual application to see which would be more appropriate. Okay. Danny, did you have anything to add? Well, all I would say is that um... First of all, I'd reiterate what Phil said there about the new masks. I have uh, noted that they have improved quite significantly and I wouldn't have anywhere near the same issues as I would have had with regards to that technology. Uh, also, I would say that uh, for some people, the mouthpiece does actually create a, a pretty bad gag reflex. So in, in those situations, it's almost impossible to use a mouthpiece. Uh, and uh, so. I think some researchers uh, and, and clinicians have decided that uh, a mask is really the way to go. The other issue about masks, of course, is they create a, a small microenvironment uh, around the mouth and nose, uh, 
and uh, and it's not really understood if that influences results at all, but but it does happen, uh, and so it's something that needs to be taken into account. Okay, great. Um, are the errors that you've discussed in general random? This question's come in from Salvik. Um, and if so, then it can be a good idea to increase the measurement time. How would you respond to that? I'm not totally sure I understand the question uh, about the errors being random. Uh, the errors for the various devices are specified by the manufacturer and that, that takes into account uh, the various source of errors for each device that could could occur and usually it's specified over over a range uh, plus or minus a certain error uh, range for that device and that should cover uh, all the errors that you might run into and it's possible you could have uh, a uh, an application where you're running a test and, and it could perform much better for that particular test but then you can go on come in the next day and and it could be performing significantly worse um, I might uh, add to that if that's okay of course go ahead so uh, so that so there are two different types of errors uh, one is a random error and one is a systematic error so the systematic errors are more or less taken out of the equation uh, by virtue of the way the software uh, and the way the calibration methodology works. So there will be systematic errors uh, which are uh, zeroed out and uh, removed from uh, any of the calculations. However, the random errors can't be because they are what they uh, what the name suggests, and that is that they are random. And the errors that we are talking about in the system are, in fact, random errors. Uh, they can be expressed in different ways. People, um, manufacturers call them tolerances, which is a, a proper scientific way of looking at them because it's a method of explaining them statistically. And also, uh, because of uh, the way that is explained, you can statistically uh, explain what the total random error of uh, the system is. Now, uh, to the, the question, or whoever had asked the question, uh, had suggested that uh, expanding the length of time will minimise the errors. Now, uh, actually, what happens there is the errors start to accumulate over time, and uh, having more time actually uh, to divide by brings you back to the same uh, issue in terms of uh, the same random error. So uh, increasing the time won't help in this situation. However, I do understand what the, the, um, the person who had asked the question uh, was trying to get at there. Uh, however, that doesn't happen here. The, the random error still exists. One of the issues that will happen over time, however, is the uh, amount of potential humidity that comes into the sample will increase, uh, thereby corrupting the sample even further, uh, giving you artificially higher VO2s. Uh, and also uh, causing problems for, for the sensors and the drying systems. So time actually isn't in your favour if, uh, if that's the strategy. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and one, one more question here. Uh, what is the current AEI recommendation on the exchange of Nafion tubing? So maybe you might be able to best address that one. Uh yeah, that's that's kind of been a uh, a t tough issue to try to solve. Um, we're we've you know reached out to the manufacturer a number of times, and their recommendation basically is that it doesn't have to be replaced. Uh, however, we we found that that in reality it it does, uh, and and I'd say even replacing it every year might not be enough. And it depends on the application, of course, and how much it's used and the environment that it's in. But uh, you might want to look at it even every six months or even uh, sooner if necessary. If you start seeing errors that sometimes you can't explain, but they could very likely be humidity errors, especially you should observe ambient air. And if the ambient air of your lab seems to be changing significantly, that could be an, uh, an indication that, that your uh, drying system isn't working correctly. 
then you might want to look at changing out the the uh, that part of the drying system, the naphthalene tubing or desiccant at that time, even if it's before the manufacturer recommends, because uh, there's probably some reason why why the um, uh, ambient air isn't measuring what you typically would get in your lab. Okay, Danny, do you have the same recommendation? Yeah, so I just add the following: um, the 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 people who I uh, have worked with, uh, and and by the way, thanks for the question. It's actually a really good question, and it is an indication of somebody who is actually on top of uh, what they're doing. The the naphion tubing is in fact an issue. Uh, the a recommendation that I have uh, been making to, to people is to replace the Nafion uh, at least twice uh, a year. However, there's an, uh, an additional problem that is some people will test more than one person at a time, in fact up to about 10 people at a time. Now if you look at the uh, scientific papers on the Nafion, you'll see that its effectiveness goes down uh, to about 50 percent after about 30 odd minutes, 25, 30 minutes, and to uh, about 10% after uh, about 45 minutes or more. So for that reason, some of the systems uh, have a recovery time. Some of the systems, uh, some of the users replace the Nafion uh, in between tests or in between a number of tests. And so I think that's, that's right and proper because uh, the humidity in the sample will, will as I said, corrupt and it's probably the biggest enemy of the metabolic uh, cart system. And also, uh, one of the things that very few of the metabolic calibrators uh, actually take into account. There is one I, I can think of uh, uh, that, that does take it into account, but I think it's the, the only one there. So uh, it's a very good question, and uh, I think that's the best answer uh, that I can give. One more thing I could say on the topic. Uh, if I can interject again, is that um, in the MOXIS system, we uh, perform all measurements through the same drying path. So the the uh, sample air, the uh, ambient air measurements, and the calibration gas all travel through the same drying system. So uh, if the drying system uh, does change, you can uh, more or less correct for it by recalibrating. Uh, so when you recalibrate between tests, that kind of corrects for, for some of the errors. So you can minimize it also by recalibrating the system as well. 